In episode one, we saw that humanistic man, having rejected God's moral absolutes and laws in an attempt to produce his own perfect, trouble-free society, has opened the doors to monstrous inhumanities. Specifically, we saw that in our generation, one of these inhumanities has taken the terrible form of abortion on demand. Abortion the killing of unwanted babies before they are born has become to many a selfish, absolute right sanctioned by the state. The inherent inhumanity in abortion is underlined by the schizophrenic double standard which abortion has forced upon society. Namely, that the life of one group in society has now been arbitrarily reclassified as non-human without either biological or scientific reason, but purely for sociological considerations. The extravagant and raw judicial power which was used to legalize abortion and the same humanistic thinking which made that a reality is in the not too distant future going to open the door to legalized infanticide. In episode two, we saw that infanticide, which is the killing of the unwanted young who are already born but with some defect or imperfection that makes them less desirable than others, has already begun to be practiced in the United States and in other countries. We saw that there is a strange silence by the legal and medical professions in regard to this admitted practice in many sectors of the medical world. Man's inhumanity to man exists in every age. We once regarded the slave as a non-person. 
Later, the Jew was perceived as a cramping nuisance upon the lifestyle that Nazi Germany had decided it wanted for itself. Today, in the United States and other countries, the unborn, unwanted child has been reclassified as a non-person, and this has opened the door to the practice of active infanticide, the killing off of the unwanted young. This is happening now. All that remains in this area of inhumanity is that the same legal bodies which officially sanction legal abortion will fully legalize infanticide and open the door to its widespread and perhaps even mandatory use. Society has decided that its ultimate goal is personal peace, comforts, and the hedonistic lifestyle. Once the doors are open with the official sanction of the state and the courts for the arbitrary reclassification of human beings, any inhumanity is possible, moreover, even likely, if it is deemed temporarily expedient. In episode three, we saw that the elderly, often regarded as a nuisance and locked away from the rest of society, are going to be the next obvious choice for reclassification as non-persons. It is unfortunate that this hedonistic society views them as a burden and has forgotten that true worth, value, and joy in life come from understanding worth in others and the sharing of enjoyment with other human beings. Not careers, not ambitions, not selfish desires, but human relationships are in the end the only real and tangible thing that we have. At the end of episode three, we looked at some practical alternatives to these monstrous inhumanities, and we challenged ourselves to real action in these areas. The series advocates that through legislative action and personal practical responsibility and involvement with these issues on the day-to-day -day level, we can help the people who are caught in these inhumanities and are facing hard choices. In episode four, we saw that the inhumanities discussed in this series have a philosophical root, that the base from which they stem is humanism, or more simply, man making himself autonomous and putting himself at the center of all things rather than the creator, God. And with this belief, man, far from being a creature of great worth, as created in the image of God, is only a machine a tinker toy to be manipulated by the whim and the will of the few who control the society in which we live. We saw philosophically that the humanist position is inconsistent and is full of problems, and that it does not have the answer to the questions which must be answered if we are to truly have a base for the function of society, but above that, for ourselves, personally. We then examined what, in the end, is the only real basis for life, and that is the teaching of the Judeo-Christian ethic and the worth that it places upon each individual. Humanistic man, Society and law have scoffed at and rejected Christian morality. But their system, instead of producing something better, has produced an awful inhuman ugliness, which has step by step led to further dehumanization of our society. We must realize that this is basically not only an intellectual or philosophical or physical problem, 
The real problem is a false view of truth. The answer lies in the reality that truth is rooted in the existence of a personal God. Far from being irrelevant, the biblical perspective is highly relevant for the people of all times in history. Its relevance holds true for our times and for the crucial issues we have been discussing in this series. revealed himself at a particular place on this planet. God revealed himself at a point in time. God revealed himself through the Bible. The Bible is not just a system of abstract ideas. It is rooted in history. Christianity involves real history. To say that is to have said something remarkable because it separates the Judeo-Christian teaching of the Bible from almost all other religious thought. I'm standing on one of the most important sites in the whole Bible, Mount Sinai. The Jews came here after they fled from Egypt. Moses was their leader. On this spot, God reached down and touched man directly, personally, lovingly. The great creator gave his creatures the rules by which they could live fully and wonderfully instead of being empty and tragic. Notice the Bible's great emphasis on history. Moses constantly told the people to remember what they had seen and heard on Mount Sinai. You came near and stood at the foot of the mountain while it blazed with fire to the very heavens, with black clouds and deep darkness. Then the Lord spoke to you out of the fire. You heard the sound of words, but saw no form. There was only a voice. Moses emphasized that those alive at the time had actually heard God's voice. They had received God's direct communication in words. They were eyewitnesses of what had occurred, the cloud and the gloom, the mountain burning with fire. Moses told the people that upon the basis of what they had observed, they were not to fear their enemies, either present or future. On the same basis, they were to obey God. Thus their trust in God and their obedience to God rested upon that which was historical and open to observation. Their relationship to God did not rest 
upon an inward experience inside of their own heads, but with an outward reality which could be seen and heard. People are to obey God not because of a leap of faith, but because of God's real acts in history, for God is a living God. This is the biblical view of truth. Religious truth is of the same order as the truth people live on in their normal lives. If a thing is true, the opposite cannot also be true at the same time. The final basis of truth is the existence of the infinite personal God in contrast to his not existing. God exists objectively. That is, he exists, whether people think he does or not. The Bible teaches that God is personal. Much of the Bible is within the sphere of normal experience. It is observable. It is describable. God communicated concerning himself in language, and this is not surprising, for he was the creator of people who use language in communicating with other people. The Hebrew biblical view of truth is grounded in the existence and character of God and what has been given to us by God in creation and revelation. Mankind being finite cannot exhaust God himself. Thus truth cannot be grounded in human reason alone. We have good reason to know what the Bible says is true because it is truth related to our own everyday history. It is within this view of truth that we must understand the Bible by its own insistence. Moses could even pass down to subsequent generations physical reminders of what God had done so that the people could see them and remember. I'm standing on the border of modern Israel and Jordan, marked by the Jordan River here below me. It is amazing to think that somewhere near here, Joshua, who was the first great Israeli military commander, carried out his campaigns. This area is still one of tension and military importance for Joshua's descendants in modern Israel. In the time of Joshua, we find in the Bible the same emphasis on historic testimony as we did in the books of Moses. God is not an abstract idea or force. Man's experience of God is not just in his head. God is active in history. At the time of Moses, he commanded that the tables of the law and Aaron's rod be kept as a reminder of what God had done. At the time of Joshua, he commanded the same type of thing. God allowed the Jordan to become dry long enough for Joshua and the Jews to pass over on dry land. As a memorial of that event, and so that it could be observed through subsequent generations, two piles of 12 stones each were made. The first pile of stones was made in the riverbed. There they could be seen for centuries when the water level was low. 
The second pile was made on the dry land at their camp in Gilgal, not too far from here, something like this, only much larger. All this was to be a reminder of God's hand in their history. Abraham was a nomad, and his lifestyle must have been very similar to these Bedouin here in Israel. Abraham had been given many evidences of God's reality and his reliability. God had spoken to him over and over again. And the Lord said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. Lift up your eyes from where you are, and look north and south, east and west. All the land that you see, I will give to you and your offspring, like the dust of the earth. He took him outside and said, look at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. And then God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son, Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about.
Abraham had come to have an heir, just as God had said. Therefore, Abraham had been established through a number of revelations and events in the certainty that God was both real and trustworthy. He had heard God. He had had communication with him. He had received propositional revelation from God, and he had seen God keep his promises. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father? Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided.
Thus, rather than Abraham being asked to make a blind leap of faith, he'd had ample evidence of God's reliability. Therefore, he could say to the servants with complete assurance, we shall return. We have come a long way in time from Abraham and Isaac. In the Bible, in the book of Acts, we read of Paul, the apostle of Jesus Christ. Brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve, and after that he appeared to five hundred of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared also to me. Though I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am who I am, and his grace to me has not been without effect. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believe. But if Christ was not raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ, in fact, was not raised. And if Christ was not raised, our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead, but he did not raise him. If the dead are not raised, and if the dead are not raised, then Christ was not raised either, and your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. And even those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. For if only in this world we have faith in Christ, then indeed we are to be pitied more than all men. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead, comes also through a man. For if in Adam all die, then in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own turn, 
Christ, the first fruits. Then when he comes, all those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. In this letter to the Corinthians, we find Paul asserts that Jesus has been raised and that we ourselves shall rise like him. Jesus rose from the dead. It was not simply a subjective experience by which the disciples were deceived. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary of Magdala went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. Then Simon Peter, who was behind John, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself separate from the linen. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. According to the Gospels, the resurrection of Christ is open to historical verification. It is written in the same frame of reference as science, in the sense that when Christ rose, he did not leave his body in the tomb. I am sitting at the garden tomb in Jerusalem, and if Christ was not buried here, it was in another tomb very much like it, and very close to this place. The resurrection is open to normal observation. There were the grave clothes, Jesus talked to his disciples, and he ate fish in their presence. As Moses said well over a thousand years before, you saw, you heard. So the Gospels say, you saw, you heard. God acted in history, and this could be observed and described in normal language. Christianity is about objective truth and not just religious experience. Both the Old and the New Testament claim to be presenting that which is truth in contrast to that which is not true. We have only one hope, and that is a firm commitment to the existence of God and the fact that the Bible is true in all the areas of which it speaks. Faith is bowing to that which is adequately sure. Faith is bowing in acknowledging that we have been created by the infinite personal God. Faith is bowing in acknowledging that we need the death of Christ to take away our moral guilt before God. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night, they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, Throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, 
It is the Lord. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you've just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. The resurrected Christ stood here on the beach of the Sea of Galilee. Before the disciples had reached the shore, Christ had already prepared a fire. The fire could be seen, and the fire could be felt. The fire could cook the fish, and the fish could be eaten for breakfast. When the fire died down, it would have left ashes on the beach. The disciples would have been well fed with bread and fish, and Christ's footsteps would have been visible upon the beach. Thomas, Christ tells us, should have believed the ample evidence given to him of the physical resurrection of Christ by the other apostles. Christ rebuked him for not accepting this evidence. He at that time, and we today, have the same sufficient witness of those who had seen and heard, who were able to touch the resurrected Christ and were able to observe what he had done. Because Thomas insisted on seeing and touching we have a more sure witness than we otherwise would have had. In the testimony of those who saw and heard, we have a sure witness. And this includes Thomas's doubt and his personal verification, which removed that doubt. We should bow before the total witness of the record which we have in the Bible, the testimony of the existence of the universe and its form and the uniqueness of man. It is enough. Believe, he has risen. And Thomas said, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. And Jesus said, put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And then Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Jesus replied, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed.